Itt vagyunk Jason Brinkel a Gala Games blockchain vezetőjével, és a Gala Games-ről, illetve hogy általában a Play to Earn műfajról fogunk beszélgetni. So Jason, thank you so much for taking the time. If I understand correctly, you are actually a Hungarian. True or false? True. Your family is from Fayer County. Nadap is the village, and as you said, you have been you have visited this village. Correct. I have visited. I was only there for about a week, but it's wonderful place, beautiful country, beautiful people. Absolutely loved it. And born in the U.S., what were your impressions in general about Hungary? I'm not thinking about economics, but like culture. What was interesting for you? General impressions. What I what I found most interesting, and and if this is going in a weird direction, please tell me. Um, what I found most interesting is the difference uh, between sort of the the classical Hungarian architecture interspersed with like the really brutalist Soviet architecture and the way that you would have these amazingly gorgeous um, like in the middle of Budapest amazingly gorgeous gorgeous buildings right next to like a big concrete square and we had this uh, well awesome awesome tour guide driver that was helping us get around and he always had uh such strong feelings about uh the the soviet architecture and things like that because he absolutely like he's hungarian to his bones and he hated to see the 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 soviet buildings that had grown up Yeah, we're going to need another 500 to 2,000 years to sort that problem out, but we're working on it. Okay, so moving on to play to earn. Uh, in, the, in the recent times, the recent months, there have been a lot of uh, play to earn ecosystem, ecosystems that just went down the toilet. Why? And what's the secret to a sustainable play to earn ecosystem? And I'm going to give you the mic for this one. Yeah, thank you. I don't want to hurt your arm. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here. The the critical thing about having a sustainable long-term play to earn ecosystem is that you have to understand that in order for energy to come out of an ecosystem, energy has to go into an ecosystem. Okay, so anytime you have something that's based on the concept of like infinite tokens being produced forever, okay it will guaranteed fall down so for us what what we do is we build economies that are um, at their root very close to zero sum in a in a few different ways so what this means is that what people take out of the game okay is equal to what is put into the game in terms of of money in terms of time in terms of play so there's never a point in time where uh anyone can think of a game as sort of like an infinite money machine because the moment that you do that is the moment that you start having very fanciful token structures that just absolutely won't stand up in in the real life the next thing is is that at the core of all of our games okay there's actual work that is being performed and new tokens enter the ecosystem because of this work okay we don't use the term play to earn we use the term play and earn because from the player's perspective what you want is you want to play an amazing game okay um most of the quote unquote play to earn games that have popped up over the last you know year uh and, and many of them pop up and then they flame out very quickly and then they're just gone and nobody knows what happened to them um most of those are based on uh sort of extremely fanciful models without deep understanding at gala we have a pretty significant team of economists who just work on tokenomics and just align those directly with a game but the key thing is is that in order for that game to function it has to be a game it has to be a real game that people are really going to want to play because it is fun if it's not a game that you would play for free it's not going to work as a play and earn game because you need people driving that game forward driving the gameplay forward in order to create opportunities for some people to take something out of that game 
Okay, so if I understand correctly, you took the mo one of the most basic laws of nature, like nothing moves uh, on an infinite time scale, uh, the laws of energy going from one and so on. So basically the way nature works and everything works and, and as the economy works or should work, let's say, and you implemented these basic laws into the fundamentals of your play to earn money. Could you please uh, give, I understand the basics, but could you give a, a concrete example of one of your projects, uh, how it works in practice, in everyday practice, in play and earn? Absolutely. So I think the, the best the best game to do this with, which which is, uh, this is a good good time to talk about it, um, and there might actually even be a little bit of alpha here for you guys. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much of this has been discussed externally, because um, you know we have we have about 450 internal uh, internal devs right now, so things get talked about all the time that that I am not necessarily there for. So we'll see. Um, Spider Tanks is coming up for global launch October 31st, okay? And what's really, what's really important about the tokenomics of Spider Tanks is there's a couple rules. The first is that the only source of inflation in, you know, the world of Spider Tanks comes through the nodes that are operating to actually support the game. They handle matchmaking functions and eventually they'll run matches themselves. Okay, so as a normal player jumping into the game, okay, you don't get, um, like, we could have a million new players jump in and that won't increase by, you know, 500 times the number of tokens that are emitted. Okay, so the thing that controls the number of tokens that are being emitted is initially tied to the nodes that are operational and what those nodes are doing, how many matches are being played, what's happening in those matches, you know, who's winning, the types of tanks that are involved. So it's a very constrained emission schedule. But then people use tokens to upgrade tanks, to purchase things, to do all of this. And when that happens, those tokens are burned. But what happens then is the burned tokens that have been put back into the game, okay, the same quantity of burned tokens gets added to essentially the play and earn pool, okay, or a portion. I think, I think there's a chunk that, that gets allocated to a few different other places, but a good chunk of it goes into the play and earn pool. And so when you play the game and you win, okay, which... This is another crazy concept for the whole play and earn space. Um, you know, when you play a game and you win, that's from that pool is where those winning amounts come from. So if nobody is spending the token, then there are people just playing the game because it's fun. But if people are spending the token and upgrading their tanks and working through the meta and, you know, doing all of this, then there's something for people to take out of the game. So, essentially, the only source of new tokens is the nodes, okay? The only way to win those tokens, okay, is through actually winning, okay? Not just like turning it on and making four clicks or, you know, swiping a couple times on your 3v3 fish battler or anything like that. Um, and the, uh, the tokens as they enter the ecosystem, the tokens that come out of the ecosystem are proportional to the tokens that go in. And so if you follow those three rules, you have a much more tightly constrained model that uh, is, is basically good for everybody because you're already playing a fun game. So you're already winning. Okay, and you're not creating an ecosystem where the the number of tokens goes shooting up through the roof and, and you know, ultimately leading to a general terrible situation for everybody. Here at the Binance Blockchain Week, we heard a presentation a few hours ago from Ubisoft. Uh, at least they were a member of a panel. When do you see Play to Earn or Play and Earn becoming a member or a part of, of the mainstream AAA gaming industry? So it depends on how... There's a few ways I can answer that question. The first way 
and this is what I think you're asking, is when will the, the big players get involved in this? I don't think they will. I think, and, and I think that just this morning, um, I have no idea when this is airing, but just this morning, uh, PC Gamer published a piece where basically Ubisoft was like saying like, well, I mean, I know we said we were going to do an NFT thing, but maybe we're not. Like maybe, uh, um, I think that by and large, big mainstream gaming companies are too slow and too afraid to do this. They're too worried about sentiment. Um, and especially if you have companies that are very large and listed companies, um, you know, EA, for example, I can't imagine a world in which EA would create a play to earn ecosystem because there's just too much risk for EA for their shareholders to handle. Well, there's my phone. It's not going to go any farther. Um, and so, so I think that, that, if we look at it from, from that perspective, I don't think that you're going to see many entrants into the market in that way. The other thing that I would say is that we're making AAA games. We're making legitimate AAA games built by people who have built the best games out there. You know, we have a team working on Last Expedition right now. I think we've got about, I don't know, 50, 50 to 70 developers on it right now. Um, and it's a, you know, absolutely triple A PVP PVE game with a play and earn element to it. And it's super, super, super fun. You go in there, you are competing, you're fighting with, uh, you're fighting with, with the environment, you're fighting against other teams, you're extracting minerals. You get to choose whether you use those minerals to craft new weapons and defenses, or you try to carry them out. It's really cool. It's a lot of fun. Um, that's a, a legitimate AAA game, and we're getting ready to uh, put tons into user acquisition. Uh, you know, just in general, as as well as through you know our partnerships with you know entities like Epic, to you know bring more of these games to the Epic Store so that people can play them on the Gala platform and on Epic. Okay, let's imagine a world where Bitcoin and crypto did not present itself. Let's, let's just imagine, do you think the gaming industry or at least one branch of the gaming industry would have gone in the direction of play and earn regardless? Or crypto was an absolutely necessary catalyst for the emergence of play and earn? To be honest, I think, I think that blockchain is required to make this work. Um, the reason that I say that is that if you were to attempt to do some of what we're doing um, in relation to, to blockchain and giving people ownership of their assets and things like that, without blockchain, it's not really possible. And so all of it is contingent on that. Otherwise, you just have uh, situations where, and, and again, this is an important thing, is that you know, when, somebody, when somebody earns something in a game, okay, they're earning it and they're the ones who choose to mint it. Okay, so it's coming from a protocol that we don't control to them as a user based on their actions and how they've contributed to that ecosystem. We aren't paying them. Does that make sense? If you do this without blockchain, then you have companies writing checks to people, which gets much more complex and ugly in a lot of different ways. Okay, and final question. What's next for Gala? Where do you see yourselves in the next five years? That's a massive question. That's massive. So what's next for Gala? So we've got a couple, a couple things that are, are you know, currently on the radar. The first is that we're moving rapidly into other entertainment verticals. So you know, you've heard of Gala Games. You may have heard of Gala Music. Gala Film is also a thing too. Um, we're working with a variety of really, really top tier producers in the music space, uh, as well as in the film space. So you're gonna see Gala become a much bigger force in entertainment as a whole. So that's one. The second thing that you're gonna see is over the next month or so, we're going to be releasing a lot more information about our L1. I personally believe our L1 will uh, be one of the more competitive blockchains 
for, for open source trustless development in the future. And I very much look forward to seeing other people build on it. So those two things uh, I see as being super, super, super important uh, to Gala and honestly to, to blockchain as a whole. Because I think that, that entertainment is huge. Entertainment, onboarding of people in entertainment is massive. And I think we're solving a lot of those problems, which is good for everybody in the, in the industry. Okay, but just one more. But do you see yourselves growing into one of the massive players of the gaming industry? Like, do you see yourself where Ubisoft was 30 years ago and you're going to be there in 10 years where Ubisoft is now? I, I took that for granted. That's assumed. That's, that's obviously what we're doing. The question is, how do we get there? Okay, and finally, do you know a few Hungarian words that you could uh, send our viewers? Just anything, anything. Any that just at least something in Hungary, any favorite food or anything you remember? I can, I can tell you. Okay, so here's here's the deal. My my great my great grandmother, um, my great grandmother was was an amazing woman, and I grew up eating her food. Okay, she. Uh, <laughs> this is why I'm fat. Okay, it's 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 her fault. Um, but she would make the most amazing foods all the time. I would spend summers with my my grandmother. Um, they lived in California, but you know, or my my grandmother and then my great grandmother came from from Hungary to to live in in California as well. But she would start off the day making like apple pancakes covered with with uh, powdered sugar. You know, and that was what, what all of us would eat for breakfast. Halfway through the morning, I'd be sitting at the computer in the living room, you know, playing a game or something, and she'd bring over, like, a snack of, like, I don't know, half a pound of cake, okay? And she would make, you know, really, really impressive cakes and, uh, you know, potato salad and massive sandwiches and things like that. Um, she used to make... Uh, used to make uh, rouladen and red cabbage and you know I, I don't know if these dishes are more Hungarian or German but it's all sort of in my mind it gets kind of mixed together um, you know because that's what she was Hungarian my little sister used to look at pictures of them uh, of my, my great-grandmother and my grandmother and very, wearing um, you know very old-fashioned outfits with like the apron and a little you know, hat and things, working in the garden in, in, in uh, Nadap, in the village. And my little sister used to look at them and say, oh, they're hungry people, because she didn't know that hungry was a place. She thought that they were just hungry. Um, but if you looked at my grandmother and my great-grandmother, you would not think that they were very hungry people. They were. She was a very robust woman with strong hands and just these massive fingers from working in the garden. She used to carry water from the stream to water her garden every day. So um, I, have a, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Hungarian people, uh, Hungarian food, and the Hungarian work ethic. Okay, then see you soon in Hungary. We'd like to invite you and hope you're gonna accept. And thanks a lot for the interview.